this topic is a little uh, unusual, but uh, because of my experience for the past 57 years studying radiology, practicing radiology, teaching radiology, and I have some authority on the past, present. Of course, I do not have any authority on the future of intravenous pyelography. Disorders of the urinary tract can be investigated by intravenous pyelography. That is the most common investigation that used to be done. And for what? Congenital or developmental disorders of the urinary tract, trauma, inflammation or infection, obstructive or even non obstructive causes, neoplastic, either benign or uh, malignant neoplasms, and miscellaneous causes. Over the years, few more diseases are added, such as AIDS, etc., hypertension, etc. Wilhelm Conrad Ronjan, we have to pay a tribute for the discovery of X rays in. 1895, and who also got a Nobel Prize in 1901. Within a year of Ranjan's discovery of X-rays, several people tried uh, for, uh, say, X-ray the skull, chest, abdomen, hands, etc. But preoperative radiological demonstration of urinary tract calculus has been reported by the taking the radiograph of the abdomen. KEB. What is KEB? When you take a radiograph of the abdomen, you have to include the kidneys. Your urinary tract, ureters, and also the bladder. Most of the time, the bladder is cut off, and thus you may miss part of the lesions of the bladder. Not only the urethra also is better to include. It includes kidneys, ureters, and bladder. The film should include suprarenal area to subpubic area. It is the basic screening method to study the abnormalities of the urinary tract. Gas, mass, stones, or even study of the bones. Apart from calcifications, foreign bodies, the size, shape, and contour of the kidneys, and the location also identified because the location is important. Is it an ectopic kidney? Is it a heart shaped kidney? Radiopaque calculi, particularly in urinary tract, can be identified since 95% of these are radiopaque. Only 5% of them are radiolucent stones. Proper patient preparation is essential before doing KUV or IVP. They avoid unnecessary gas shadows or calcifications. More than 3 millimeters may be missed on pain films, in which case we have to do the ultrasound. Ultrasound also may be missed. And then in which case CT is quite sensitive for small stones. Look at these two films, KUV films, bilateral, renal and ureteral calculi on the right side. Ureteral calculus like a cast. And the Left side renal and prostatic calcifications are also noted. And deal with renal tubular acidosis primary. What is it? It results in nephrocalcinosis because of the tubular acidosis. Look at the film, multiple calcifications and inability to excrete acid urine. Metabolic acidosis results and females is more common. Late development of enzymatic carbonic anhydrase, 75% of nephrocalcinosis. Nephrocalcinosis should be differentiated from urolithiasis, calcifications in the calyces and calyces. 50% result in osteomalacia, in children, of course, in the kids. One on your left side, bladder calculus, the shape of the bladder, and then you find different type of calcifications. For example, in the on your right side, you find irregularities, peculiar type of calcification, and in the one below, calcification and avoid calcification at the urethrovesical junction. Occasionally, you may find calcification of the urinary bladder because of the cystosomiasis. Of course, rarely you may find calcification of the bladder in infections, in tuberculosis, and also not only in tuberculosis, neoplasms also in the mangium. Multiple pulvolis may be seen. In carcinoma of the bladder, occasionally you may see calcification. Developmental origins, renal agenesis, unilateral, because if there is bilateral agenesis, the child does not survive. Unilateral, no clinical symptoms, and KB findings, left is agenesis is associated with malposition of splenic flexure. Splenic flexure comes into the renal fossa. And on right side, descending duodenum fills the right renal fossa. 
this two-year-old boy swelling of the abdomen. That's the clinical finding. When the mother comes and complains, no, my child has got a swelling in the abdomen. Mass in the left loin. There are no calcifications. What is the origin? This is spleen, this is kidney, or other retroperitoneal masses. And then IVP may be skipped today because ultrasound gives us the clue. If there is calcification. There which organ it belongs? Is it splenic, renal, or extrarenal? So much information can be obtained by ultrasonic. And then another case, plain films shows pockets of gas in the left renal fossa, different, both of them are two different cases. That's why you see different distribution, different morphology of the gas. This is seen in emphysematous pyelonephritis. In 1934, perirenal insufflation was popular and air was a that insufflation of air is performed to note the size, shape, and location of the kidneys, adrenals, or other retroperitoneal. Look at the perirenal insufflation. Nice outlining of the kidneys, also the adrenals. But then today, that interventional procedure is abandoned because we have got other procedures to identify the adrenals and kidneys, namely ultrasonography, CT, MRI, etc. What is the history? Let us know some of the past history of the intravenous pyelography. Moses Swick, 1928, used sodium salt of 5 iodode to pyridine acetic acid called uroselecton at this time to perform first intravenous pyelography. In 1929, he presented a paper on uroselecton for intravenous pyelography. In 1954, Evans et al. introduced nephrotomography. These are the investigative nature of the radiologist to know further and further about the scientific aspects of the abdominal organs. Development of contrast media, you know, you just note 1930, Puran, 50, Diodrast of Eurocon, 56, Diatrozoic acid, 62, Iothalamic acid, 70, Metrizomai, 2007, several non-ionic, today non-ionic contrast media are popular. And if you look into why these contrast media are used, not necessarily to visualize the urinary tract, but 1927, cerebral angiography, 1950, nuclear medicine, scintigraphy, 53, modern angiography, 1960, ultrasonography, 70, CT, 80, these are all the modern investigations that are discovered and started in the years that are mentioned. Contrast-induced nephropathy is a well-documented phenomenon. All is not well with contrast media, although they give us the morphological nature and also functional nature of the urinary tract, but still with larger quantities, particularly contrast-induced nephropathy is noted. Of course, it is much decreased with non-ionic contrast media. One on your left side is normal IVP, note the calicial system, pelvis, and part of the ureters. In order to know and define the resolution of the calices, pelvis, and proximal ureters better, we used to use some balloons to compress the ureters at the pelvis. And then relax it, then at which time the entire ureter and bladder are well noticed. This is a picture of the pelvis including the urethra. Didn't include the urethra, we could have missed that calculus, urethral calculus. That's why I always insist the radiographer should notice not only the kidneys, supraglenals, and below the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and at least proximal urethra. Uric acid calculi, as I said, they are very lucent, the lower pelvic acid system showing as filling defects. How do you differentiate from benign or malignant neoplasms. Generally, those neoplasms are so the irregular type of nature. Here it is smooth type of filling defect. IVP in this case shows filling defect in the right pelvis due to aberrant papilla. That is an abnormal developmental variation and this is an incidental finding. There is no clinical significance. High quality IVP is commitment. What is the commitment on the 
behalf of the radiologist, you have to have good equipment, use proper technique, contrast media, you have to regulate the dose and the type of contrast media and the rate of injection and of course monitor the films periodically and know the high risk known allergies, old age risk group, severe systemic disorders like multiple myeloma, amyloidosis, renal failures, renal transplant. Low osmolality contrast should be routine, but for the cost small. These are little costly, but still for the sake of the safety of the patient, we prefer low osmolality. Clinical benefits should justify the cost. The principle of primum non nocere, that is, don't hurt the patient. Primarily, don't hurt the patient implies safer agents when they are available and accessible. Number of IVPs greatly depends upon socio-economic condition. For example, if you go to western countries, number of IVPs have reduced considerably. If you go to some other reform, no sir, we don't do any IVP. On the other hand, if you go to community areas in India, for example, they don't have access for CT, MRI or even ultrasound, so they resort to Cities and academic institutions, number of IVPs is reduced by 5 to 10 percent and replaced by advanced imaging techniques. Sometimes it's an overkill, even what you can find with a simple IVP, use costly procedures like CT, MRI, etc. Mid level towns, IVP is the major investigation in the study of urinary tract. Ultrasonography also could be used. In fact, that should be the first screening method, then IVP. Rural areas, no access for anything at all. In present, what is happening in the present? The level of health care can be correlated with the number of x-ray machines available per person. While at tertiary level, say in urban areas, in these places, one imaging equipment is available for 2,000 persons, including corporate hospitals. At rural level, one imaging equipment is available for 2 lakhs of people. That means that is not accessible or available to the rural people. When we are talking about IVP, we should know the geographical status of radiology. For example, the farmer here has got a cell phone. Thank God for the communications system in our country advances. He, but he can't get an IVP unless he travels at least for 100 kilometers. That is the paradox of the situation of healthcare today. Today, ultrasonography is readily available even in peripheral areas. No IV contrast is necessary and involves no radiation, that is the advantage. But limited value in the study of ureters and does not show a small renal calci, does not really tell us the renal function. Although sometimes we can tell, but not as much as IVP shows. It provides limited tissue characterization. Color Doppler studies help for abnormal vasculature and also the blood flow, blood flow to the kidneys. CT is excellent to study the functional as well as anatomical abnormalities with reformatted images. But anatomic details of subtle changes may not be detected. To study the renal vasculature, CT angio is ideal. It is costly and there is risk of radiation exposure, especially when you are dealing with children. Better for visualization of parenchyma and tumor staging. With, today with MDCT, you have got the advantage of studying the vasculature also and the resolution is high. Now coming to magnetic resonance urography, it is also costly, may not demonstrate calcifications or show subtle abnormalities, but there is no risk of radiation at all. MRI is good for vascular studies, better for tumor staging, metallic lipsets are a hindrance to study MRI. Sometimes we use contrast, gadolinium or MR contrast, occasionally it is also a risk procedure. Scintigraphy it gives a good information about renal function, good for hypertensive studies and vesico ureteral reflux it is costly and is not easily available. In fact, CT is better available in some of the district towns rather than scintigraphy. It gives limited anatomic detail. When there is contraindication for IVP, say because of the allergic conditions or previous reactions, nuclear scan may be used. It involves radiation exposure also, that is the risk that we take. 
congenital malformations. Let us deal with congenital malformations. And IUP is sufficient for ectopic kidneys, double kidneys, triple kidneys, double ureters, and horseshoe kidneys, pelvic kidneys. All this IUP is sufficient. For obstructions, the obstructed upper moiety of a duplicated system, and you see the drooping lily appearance, drooping duplex right kidney, and sometimes these are associated with ureterocele. IVP is good. Ureterocele, what are the radiological appearances? Cobra head, radiocent, halo around the ureter, intravesical segment of the ureter is dilated, stenosis at ureteral opening leads to prolapse of ureteral mucosa, that is the pathophysiology. Cobra head or occasionally onion skin appearance of a right sided ureterocele that you could see. Here, a 32 year old female on your uh, left side pelvic radiograph with IVP, note the simple ureterocele. And on the other hand, on your right side, you see 70 year old child with ectopic type of ureterocele with because the double ureter. And you find a low filling defect simulating a hematoma or even a neoplasm. Now we come to caliceal diverticular. Etiology is unknown. Are they developmental? We don't know. Usually single. Isthmus from calyx often is not visualized. Just you see the, you know, the calyx filled with contrast material looking like a diverticular. Now we go for cystic lesions of the kidney. These are very common that we come across both in childhood as well as in adult life. Multicystic dysplastic kidney, medullary sponge kidney, polycystic kidneys which may manifest either in the infant or in the adult. Renal cyst, very common in adult uh, age group, simple. Hydratic cyst, hemorrhagic cyst, cystic nephroma resembling a cyst, cystic hypernephroma. Now you see the two IVP pictures, one on your left side is the plain film showing typical calcifications in a medullary sponge kidney. Note the clustered intramedullary calcification is the characteristic of indicating that is a medullary sponge. Of course, IVP relation to the ectatic medullary collecting ducts, they are dilated. That is where the stasis occurs and then calcification. Discrete linear densities in one or more papillae, deformed papillae with beaded or even striated type of appearance. Again, medullary sponge kidney, IVP, dilatation of collecting tubule with one or more renal pyramids can be involved. It could be either unilateral or even bilateral. High contrast, high volume IVP may show tubular blush. It should not be mistaken for medullary sponge kidney has to be distinguished from medullary sponge kidney. Now we come to simple cysts. They are missed in routine IVP. Often we do not, in fact some people even diagnose on plain film, but if they are small they may not be able to identify. Nephrotogram, tomogram was a, another radiological procedure where you can see the filling defect in the right renal pelvis due to a simple Infantile polycystic kidneys, IVP, look at the enlarged kidneys and the tubular blush. Now we come to the renal injury, contusion, there is superficial laceration, deep laceration communicating with character system, shattered kidney or occlusion of a renal artery or dissection of a renal artery, evolution of erythropelvic junction. Of all abdominal injuries, kidney ranks the first in frequency. Because there are two operated organs, that is one reason, and also blunt injuries and the loins. Then what do you do in renal trauma emergency? IVP, if it is normal and the patient is relatively asymptomatic, please observe the patient. And if the IVP is abnormal and the patient is symptomatic, CT, scintigraphy, etc., you can proceed. 18 year old boy with history of trauma and the IVP shows disruption of right lower pole. Look at the hanky panky type of hazy contrast. And then extravasation of contrast could be pylosinus, 
pilotubular, pilovenous, pilolymphatic, pyloparenchymatous. Pyloparenchymatous usually occurs not only in trauma, in malignant lesion. 